everyone. Welcome back to another episode of God is Not a Theory with Ken Fish. I'm your host, Grant Emerton. And on today's episode, we're continuing our conversation. I think we're going to be in this conversation probably all year off and on. And we're continuing the conversation of the need for a reformation. What is a reformation? Uh, what are we going to do? We've recorded those already. So I encourage you, if you're just now tuning into this conversation, this is part three. So it wouldn't be a bad idea to go back and listen to uh, the last couple as, as we spend some time framing the idea of reformation, and then we continue to build on that. So this is a building conversation, and it's a big topic. And so we want to, uh, we want to make sure to take our time and, uh, and, and walk through this because uh, the Lord is doing something. He's moving, and he is getting ready to, uh, I believe, release uh, a reformation upon us. And so we want to be ready to, to steward that. So, Ken, I'm excited to get back to this topic. I love having guests, but I think both you and I are, are sort of burning with this, and it continues. I, I met with a pastor uh, a couple of days ago, and it's just like it's in him, too, and he's feeling it. And the more that I... I talk with other pastors, other leaders, the more they're just feeling that something needs to change. Something yeah. has to, something has to give. So I'm excited that we're having this conversation and, uh, and I'm excited that you're, you're, I believe you're the one sort of out there in the forefront leading it. And I, I can't really think of a better uh, person to do that as you waxed so eloquently uh, about all of this. So uh, thanks. I think we're all thankful and grateful that you're doing this. So uh, what do you got for us today? Part three of, of Reformation, where, where, where are you taking us? Well, I want to talk about another principle that needs to guide uh, this Reformation that, that we're calling for. And uh, so with this one, I want to take a look at the book of Isaiah as our framing passage. Uh, last time when we were talking, we looked at Revelation 3, 2, of the reputation of being alive and needing to strengthen what is weak and is about to die. But Okay, now that we have strengthened what is weak and is about to die, or at least think we have, or have tried to, uh, or maybe we've given intellectual assent to it, but right. we haven't quite gotten there yet. We haven't strengthened it, but we know it needs to be strengthened. Yeah, right. All hands are in the air saying, I'm in. Uh, I, I want to now talk about this next principle. And it's interesting, you know, Isaiah is the prophet that more than any other prophet Jesus quotes, mm -hmm. um, certainly uses many of the prophetic uh, books in the Old Testament, and Paul does too, but Isaiah gets quoted more than any of them, and in the 28th chapter of Isaiah, uh, it says this, starting in verse 9, to whom will he teach knowledge, and to whom will he explain the message? In other words, not everybody's going to hear this, and, you know, there is, a, there is knowledge, not just wisdom. These are different words. Knowledge is uh, what I tend to call facts. It's, it's, it's learnable maybe from a book. We might know how to, I don't know, do engineering equations, math equations. Uh, we might have knowledge of plant life. We might have knowledge of biblical languages and history. And all of this is important, but it's not the same thing as wisdom. Wisdom is, wisdom has a sense of EQ to it, or what is these days called EQ, that emotional quotient the sort of, I get it, and I know what to do with this knowledge at the right time. Not all knowledge is equally relevant in every situation. It, you know, it has its own niche. For example, you might know a lot about fluid mechanics and, and uh, structural dynamics, but if you're not designing airplanes or, or uh, water systems for a city, maybe that knowledge isn't that relevant. Right. So, you know, relevancy and applicability is part of uh, what transitions us out of uh, knowledge into wisdom. But here we have, to whom will he teach knowledge? Who will he explain the basics to? Hang on just one second, Grant. I just had a call, try to come in, and I want to turn my computer so that it cannot ring. Okay. Give me one moment. You'll just have to edit this thing out. Where's my little switch for that? Right there. I am going to put it in do not disturb mode for one hour. Okay, there we go. All right, now we won't have that problem. 
All right. So there's a difference between wisdom and knowledge. But here it says, to whom will he teach knowledge? Who will he give the basics to, the facts, the we could call them the fundamental principles? And then to whom will he explain the message? I think explaining the message, that really implies unpacking it. And so now we're transitioning out of fundamental principles into what's this going to look like? How's it going to be lived out? Right. This is all coming out of Isaiah. I'm just giving what a, or what a rabbi would call midrash on the text. Okay. And so, uh, and then it says, well, here's the answer to those twin questions. To whom will he teach knowledge and to whom will he explain the message? Uh, the answer is to those who are weaned from the milk, to those who are taken from the breast. Well, you know, it implies that if you're taken from the breast and you're weaned, you're no longer a baby, you're at least a toddler. Right. And, you know, that's an interesting concept because we have in, uh, in the book of Hebrews, the writer to the Hebrews, some people think that was Paul. I tend to think it was Barnabas. It sounds very Pauline, but it's, it's not Paul. Um, so who is it? Um, and again, I think it's Barnabas, but whoever it was that wrote Hebrews will probably never solve that question. Whoever that person was talks about the need for us to move beyond spiritual milk mm -hmm. and to go on to maturity. And, and that writer, whoever that person was, basically says, you should be eating meat by now, but you're not because you're still living on milk, spiritual milk. And it doesn't say it this way, but the, the tone of the passage implies shame on you. Yeah. You really should be moving on beyond this kind of basic stuff. And it's not that the basics don't right. matter. It's that if all we ever do is the basics, we never get to the other stuff. So I think, you know, kind of underneath that passage in Hebrews that speaks of moving into spiritual maturity, probably that writer to the Hebrews, again, it's written to Hebrews, so they would have known their own scriptures, is this phrasing out of Isaiah. It, it's, it's implied, but it's not stated explicitly. Right. So those who are weaned uh, from, from the milk, those who are taken from the breast, those are the ones who will get knowledge and wisdom. Mm -hmm. And so with that, you know, I, I think this idea of reformation carries with it the idea that we are being called higher. We are being called heavenward. Uh, we could say it's the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. But, and that, of course, is a direct quote from Paul out of Philippians. But, but we we want to move uh, into things that are more substantive. We could say they move the needle, they're game changers. There's different ways of articulating that. I wanna, I wanna stay away from the idea of deep esoteric knowledge. Right. I think spiritual knowledge should in the end be very pragmatic and uh, very practical. These aren't quite the same thing. Uh, pragmatic usually refers to the nature of a person or a, a teaching or something. And practical means it actually has relevance in the modern world. Yeah, I think I think it's really important here to say to people, because I know some of our listeners uh, are coming from the charismatic uh, experience and some of them aren't. And I know that one of the things I deal with as a pastor of a charismatic church is people want the deeper stuff. And what that typically means is they want like the ooey, weird, super spiritual stuff. Uh, that's not what we're referencing here. We're, we're more talking about like, you know, we got to move past you, you know, being in, in del deliberate sin and disobedience in order to get to, you know, further down the road of your sanctification. If we just have to spend every week talking about, yeah, you can't do that anymore. Like that's a sin. You're, you're willingly doing that. We'll never move past it. So we're, we're more talking about that way as growing up and maturing as opposed to discovering some sort of, you know, secret book of Enoch that, that is going to unlock the code for you to go transport to heaven or something like that. Right. I mean, I yeah. think that's important for some of our listeners, for some of our listeners, they just tuned out and that's okay. You should tune out and uh, we'll get back, back to it. But, um, but you know, one of my most popular sermons the last couple of years has been the one on the ninth apostolic incarnation of Enoch. <laughs> that's a joke for any listeners who may be wondering, what did I just say? Uh, but it, it shows the kind of, you know, thinking where, where people's minds want to wander to. And yet, you know, let's go back to this idea of first principles. I think all of us would be aware of or have heard the stories of or maybe grew up in churches where every single week there was an altar call given for people to get born again. 
well, if the church is the company of the redeemed, presumably after a while you've fished that pond out. Right. Um, and, you know, if there's guests or visitors or it's a special service where there may be outsiders present, well, then it becomes more relevant. But to keep giving an altar call week by week by week in a church that is, you know, people who are the converted, this is staying stuck on the basics of the faith rather than advancing people into the, you know, the next thing. And, you oh, know, John yeah. Wimber had a very good guideline. It was very folksy and colloquial, but he always used to say, focus on the main and the plain. And that's how we stay away from esotericism, right? We, we focus on what's clearly in scripture and what's clearly articulated. And if we, if we stay with that, we'll probably be, for the most part, in pretty good shape. Right, right. There's enough in there uh, to, to figure out before going somewhere else. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, good. So we're moving past that. We're, we're, they're, they're hearing uh, this echo of Isaiah in their ears uh, as, as the writer of Hebrews is explaining um, the idea of weaning off uh, of the basics and moving right. into maturity. So what does that look like? Where are we going? So Isaiah goes on now, and now we're in chapter 28, verse 10. And he says, for it is precept upon precept, uh, precept upon precept line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. And it's interesting to me that, that he reiterates it, right? Precept upon precept, precept upon precept. In, in English, we would have probably transitioned and said precept upon precept, line upon line. Well, Isaiah is specifically referring to the writing of the law, the Torah. And he's saying, so we're going to teach uh, literally word by word or verse by verse, if we, if we prefer that, um, that's what we mean by line upon line. But precept upon precept is referring to the concepts that are embodied in the very words themselves. So if we only talk about, and we've all heard these sermons where the pastor says, well, this here is an aorist Greek, and it means this, and the word is, you know, lambano or whatever, you know, that, that is a Greek word, but, you know, and so, you know, he gives this kind of long thing on lambano and everyone's eyes glaze over and they're like, I have no idea what this means. There's a place to give that kind of understanding to ground people, to anchor what we're saying and show that we've done our homework, but we also have to teach precepts. And I think it's interesting that Isaiah says we have to teach precepts before lines. So we're going to give people the if you will, as we say in modern modern communication theory, we're going to give people the what's in it for me before we tell them wh why do we believe this way? What what does this tie back to? But we do have to show people where it ties back to because this is how we ground people so they don't get blown off course later on when someone goes, well, I don't believe that. Right. That that I never heard that before. Why why do you say that? And people are like, well, I don't know. My pastor said it. And then just becomes more men against men, words of preachers against words of preachers. And so the, the right order is we're going to, we give them the what's in it for me, the, the, the precept, the concept, the action principle. I'm, I'm trying to use, you know, interchangeable terminology here. And it's founded upon the clear, relevant explication of the word of God. Right. And this is a principle of reformation for us because in a lot of quarters in the modern church, I would say that the preaching is really shallow. Yeah. Uh, there are many places you can go. There are many, you know, well-known preachers who have quite visible ministries who don't often open the word of God. I mean, literally open the book, right? I've, I'm, I've got one here in my hands right there. They don't open the book. You've got yours uh, and actually read from it and then say, this is what the language says and this is what it means. And the reason that matters is well, over you know, time. Go ahead. Well, it's, I mean, I was struck recently, uh, you know, it's explicitly stated in the New Testament of how do you do things when you come together, that there will be a long public reading of scripture. And I was just thinking like, I mean, you know, that's what we do, right? How often have I read through the book of, you know, especially like Revelation, right? There's a special blessing, it says, for those that that read this book aloud. And, he, you know, and, and it's like, I've never read that book aloud. And there's an explicit stated blessing on that because there's power in the word of God. I mean, much more than us. And so you're right. I mean, there there needs to be that public exhortation of, of scripture reading more than just a little verse and let me expound on it. 
That's exactly right. And part of the reason we are where we are is people don't know the word of God. Um, you know, on more than one occasion, I might say many occasions, you know, when I've gone somewhere to speak, the local pastor has said, well, I speak too long. And believe me, I know how to be succinct, sometimes succinct to the point of being almost, you know, terse. Right. Um, but oftentimes I find that I have to give a lot of background and context so that people understand what it is they're even hearing because that's no longer being provided week by week in many churches. Some churches still do it, of course, but, but many do not. And so, uh, you know, as they say, to get a B-52 into the air, it takes 15,000 feet of runway. Well, if you're going to deliver a heavy payload, you might need to build a long runway. And sometimes we have to do that with the, whether it's the culture of the, of the times, whether it's the history of the times, whether it's the languages of the passage, but we've got to get the word of God back into people because the hard, the hard reality is there's never been a real authentic move of God, a genuine restoration of any kind that wasn't somehow anchored to, founded in the very scriptures themselves. Yeah, and we, we see this ahead. play out in the, in the book of Nehemiah, right? I mean, it's the discovering of, of the law and reading it and that it causes a complete restoration. You know, that's causes, right. you know and, and it's that discovery of the written word yeah and, that's and, and i think one of the one of the things of where we've drifted as a church community not not one specific congregation but collectively is uh you know we've come to where we no longer have an appetite for the word of god and i think i think part of what our calling is that not many people would phrase it this way but obviously i do but i think part of our calling is we are called to be fascinated by god and what he says and we are to cling to what he says, you know, as we would to the words of say, I don't know, when we're in love with somebody, we listen to everything they say, and we, you know, we consider it, and we think about the very nuances, the very word choice, or the inflection of the voice as they were speaking. You know, there's that sort of attentiveness. I think we're called to something like that in our dealings with God, and and one of the ways that is reflected is in our hunger, our appetite for the Bible. And yet we live in a time where I would say many believers, not all, but, but enough, don't really have an appetite for the word of God. It's almost like we've weaned them away from the word of God. And that's one of the things I liked about Bobby Connor when we had him on the show. He's, he's wow. widely viewed as a prophet, widely viewed as a prophet, and yet he quotes scripture incessantly. It's clear that he's memorized huge blocks of it. And he even made the comment in his, you know, in his conversation with us that if you're going to be a worthwhile prophet, if you're going to have engaging, meaningful prophecy, you will, you will know the word of God and you will, you will interpret it well, too. It's not enough just to quote it because people can quote things out of context all the time, but it's to quote it as it was intended, to quote it with its original meaning. And this is all wrapped up in this idea of precept upon precept, precept upon precept line upon line, line upon line. You know, we're going to teach people what the concepts are, sure, but we're also going to teach them the very, the very foundational words, even down to the lettering. Jesus said every jot and tittle, which means the, the vowel pointing in the original, you know, Hebrew text, all of that is inspired, and there's something in it, but we live in a time where that is not really being uh, rendered for the most part, from the pulpits of the land, and yet we have to do it in a life-giving way. This can't be just a boring, exegetical lecture. Right, and I think, and I mean, this happened yesterday during one of the prayer sessions that I was telling you about uh, before we started this. You know, we we had to explain why it was wrong, of what what he had done, not just that it was wrong, but what was actually going on when you're, you know, when you're smoking pot. You know, you're, you're burning incense to this, you know, instead of the incense rising up to the nostrils of God and pleasing him as worship, it was rising up to something else. And it was causing, uh, you know, a demonic uh, manifestation and reaction, all that sort of stuff. But he never thought of it that way. Right. Just, his thing was like, just don't do it. And he really didn't know why, but it was just because, you know, maybe God hates fun. And so... But once you sort of expound and explain it, they're like, whoa, we didn't know that's what was going on. And I think that's what you're talking about is opening up the scriptures and saying, this is what it says, instead of just don't do it, you know. Right. 
and and people don't know why they they shouldn't do things and typically if they don't know then they'll just do them you know yeah i think a lot of the strictures and commandments that god gives in his word are because and and you know we we before i even finish my thought let me just say this in the old kind of old school paradigm of christianity the one that i became quite familiar with when i was growing up as a kid uh you know in my grandparents soundly evangelical church uh there was a lot of this don't do it but there wasn't a real understanding of why and there was a very dualistic understanding you're either saved or you're unsaved so if you do this you're going to hell if you don't do it well then probably you're among the redeemed but but there is this kind of middle ground that many evangelicals are not all that sensitive to and that's the realm of the spirit and there are times when you engage in certain practices they might be as you just intimated uh in the realm of drugs but it could be other things it could be in the realm of doctrine it could be in the realm of other religions it could be sexual there's a lot of things we can get ourselves involved with and these things may not per se be black white saved unsaved they may have to do with the demonic you're opening demonic gateways into your life and evil spirits will take advantage of that and take up residence in your life and now they begin to afflict you and assail you and you find it coming out in multiple forms it could be something of a food allergy it might be you're a little <laughs> crazy in the head uh you might be filled with anxiety emotional instability there's a lot of ways this can take shape but the but the end result is it's demonic and now we have a deliverance problem and of course in if you're in a church where deliverance isn't practiced <clears throat> or is you know maybe frowned upon or ridiculed and mocked or if you've been around you know some of the more de arcane deliverance practices that people kind of get into that that at times can border on abusive uh you know when you've got all that going on you, you don't really have a solution when when the problem is now demonic and so people remain trapped in bondage and of course in the old covenant where a lot of these kinds of things are clearly are elaborated upon in the old covenant they didn't have the blood of jesus they only had the blood of goats and bulls so they literally had no solution in this lifetime at all Right. And so God told him, just stay away. I can't tell you about Jesus. He's, he's, you know, hundreds of years in the future. So rather than try to, you know, explain all of this stuff, I'm just telling you, don't do it. I'm the Lord, honor me, respect me, don't do it. Well, that still remains true today. We still shouldn't be doing it. Sure, there's an answer in deliverance. But, you know, before we started this recording, you were telling me about a deliverance session or two of them, I guess, that all up went from 4 p.m. to 1 a.m. yesterday. So you and a friend spent nine hours driving demons out of two people to get them free. Well, that's a lot of time, or as a friend of mine used to say, that's a lot of jet fuel to burn up. Right. And if those people had never gotten into those things, they wouldn't have needed nine hours of deliverance between them. Yeah, you, you really come to appreciate living a holy life. Right. <laughs> it's not just because you're prudish, it's like, man, you know, I'm, I'm so thankful that I had a, I grew up in a, in a, in a background that I was afraid of God, you know, more than I was afraid of, of other things. Now, my motivations might have been off, but it sure did keep me out of a lot of trouble that I don't necessarily have to deal with. You know, as I listen to people's stories, it's like, whoa. So there's a reason the Lord says, don't do things. That's right. Exactly. And that's what I think, that's what you're talking about. We got to begin to contextualize and, and, and make people understand that this isn't, we're not just trying to to you know govern their lives we're trying to help and keep them from bondage and keep them from you know the the wages of sin which are death that's right yeah and death comes in many forms i mean the end result all looks the same <laughs> you got a you got a pile of meat uh but but death comes in many forms it can be again it can be mental uh you know failure to, to function fully mentally it can be emotional instability or fragility, what we call lack of resilience. Uh, it can be literal physical diseases and afflictions of various kinds. Uh, all of this stuff can come out of demonic uh, infestation. And so we want to just stay away from anything that can open doorways to demons. Well, all right, so let's let's get back to this thing. So this second uh, major you know, pillar of reformation uh, deals with this idea of precept upon precept. And Isaiah says it twice, precept upon precept. 
and then line upon line, line upon line. This is a this is a known uh, technique you know, to those who study Hebrew and Hebrew literature that when something is repeated, uh, we, we hear an echo of it in the New Testament, out of the mouth of two or more witnesses shall every matter be established. So Isaiah says it twice, not because he didn't realize he just wrote it. He says it twice because it's his way of emphasizing what he's saying. We got to teach the concepts and we got to teach the underlying verbiage of the word of God so people are pinned down to it and they hold these things in their minds and in their hearts. You know, when God spoke to Joshua as he was getting ready to cross the Jordan River and to take the Holy Land, you're going to have to pause this. The cleaners are here and the dog. Okay. So this, this construction, you know, it gets translated into English verbatim, but people often wonder, why does it say it twice? This is a Hebraism. It's a way of saying, this is really important. Today, we would, you know, bold it, underline it, italicize it, and turn the letters red. That's really the equivalent of what we're talking about here. But it's, it's got to be that we teach the precepts, and then we've got to teach the underlying concepts. But we do it, this last little bit, here a little, there a little. So it means we can't give people so much so quickly that like a baby being overfed, it just, bleh, you know, erps it back up. We give them a little bit, let them kind of chew on it, learn to live that, and then we give them a little bit more. But, you know, there's been such an erosion in the wider Christian community of scriptural knowledge I mean, how in the world would we expect our society to live by anything that has any scriptural substance to it? Right. So we, we're going to start with the church because we have to start with the church. And as they say, judgment begins with the house of God. Well, so does reformation. Mm. And then as we begin to have a biblically literate populace again within the church community, now we can start to collaborate, or excuse me, not collaborate, but communicate with our neighbors, with our unsafe friends and family members. This is why I believe what I believe. And this is, by the way, not only, I don't just believe it woodenly, I don't just believe it doctrinally, I believe it because it's a way of life. It functions, it keeps me off the rocks. If we live this way, we don't have that kind of a problem. You know, when I woke up this morning, I, I looked at my phone and one of the items in my news feed was about a person who's, I would say, reasonably well known in the public square. I won't name the name here, mainly because it doesn't matter who it is. Um, but this individual is in trouble for having engaged in child pornography and apparently had some sort of tracking software on his computer. So his wife knew everything that he was looking at you know, an accountability software. A lot of Christians use this for, you know, if they're caught in pornography so that somebody who's close to them knows what they're up to and holds them accountable. And presumably the shame factor together with the exhortation factor, you know, keeps them away from doing it. But this individual is currently out on bail. And, uh, but his wife was obviously aware of what, you know, he was wanting to look at and be engaged in. And, you know, we could actually ask the question if there's a, if there's a scriptural commandment in this case against adultery and against fornication and against the worship of Molech and of Ashtoreth and of Baal. These are three of the big, you know, bad boys of the Canaanite pantheon that God over and over speaks out against. Why is that relevant? And the answer is all of these things are themselves in one way or another, some form of adultery. Jesus uses this language that if you look on a woman with lust in your eye, you've committed adultery with her. Well, just so if you look on a child with lust in your eye, you've committed adultery in this case against your wife uh, with a child. And you know it's made worse by the fact that to, uh, to sully and taint a child uh, can destroy a society and I might add here, just as a, as a lacuna, really, that you know, the vast majority of people who are lesbian or gay, somewhere early in their life, were in one way or another sexually abused. It may not have been all the way to what we call rape. It might have been something a little short of that. It doesn't make it okay. It's just, but, but you know, it may well have gone all the way to rape. And this is part of the root of this explosion of LGBT behavior that we see in our society today is we took the wraps off and now 
you know, children are more widely sexually abused than they were in a previous era. And so, you know, God knew what he was doing when he said, don't engage in Moloch worship, where they would generally, uh, as part of the ritual, they would abuse the children sexually before they offered them. Ashtoreth worship included this. Baal worship, yes, but maybe not quite to the same degree. Not all gods were worshiped the same. Um, and we have this stricture against adultery, which is far more than just, you know, did a man and woman who are married to other people have sexual relations with each other. Adultery is really the violation of the marriage covenant in any way. I think that's the, the operative concept behind the commandment against adultery. But see, if we, if we teach it that way, people start to grab a hold of why this matters. They start to understand that there's a spiritual power that gets released into their lives. They might become demonized with spirits of adultery or Molech or Ashtoreth or Baal or pornography, or, you know, it just sort of goes on. And so they're going to need deliverance from all that, or they're probably not going to be able to get free. This is one of the reasons that so many people who struggle with pornography can't seem to stay away from it. They are, you know, it's like, I can't stop myself. And so they put this tracking software on it. Well, all that comes out of a moment's, you know, look at a, at a news story this morning, but it shows us how in our time, these ancient things of scripture are extremely relevant and actually provide an opportunity for us to speak into the life of a community and look at our society. It's falling apart sexually. And I'm not just talking about LGBT now, I'm gonna widen it and say, think of all the rage and outrage that we see exhibited by say, well, women um, against men. And they say, I don't need men. And you know, I've always, men have always tried to do their thing with me. And uh, where is that coming from? Because people are not honoring the word of God as it pertains to adultery and they say, well, you know, we're allowed to sow our wild oats. No, you're not. You're supposed to reserve your body for your spouse. And then, you know, you can give yourself fully in marriage to your spouse. Who's saying that anymore, really, in our churches? And when we do, people go, oh, that's so prude. It's so out of date. It's not realistic. We have contraception. So that was really about not bearing children out of wedlock. Well, that's an issue, too. And what do we have today? An explosion of abortion. It's become the new contraception. All of this is flowing out of the violation of this commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. Right. And I mean, I could keep going. I said it was going to be a lacuna. It's about to become a sermon. So I better shut up and go back to what I was really trying to say. But it just shows you that these things that, that we're talking about have direct and serious relevance in our time. And so we're going to do it a little at a time, a little at a time. We're going to give people enough that they can assimilate it. And we want to do it, I would say, maybe with a sense of order and structure. You know, with these broadcasts that we're doing, you know, you and I have kind of decided that every other week we're going to talk about a Reformation principle. And every other week we're going to do an interview with another person. There's a structure. There's a plan to it. There's a flow to it. We need to be intentional about how we instruct people about the ways of God. Absolutely. So, um, and then the, the last thing I want to say about this, not just teaching in small bites, but theological teaching, the recovery of, uh, you know, valid and serious uh, biblical teaching and theological instruction is not merely to be dogma. I mean, people should know good Christian doctrine, and it's amazing how often they don't. But that's not really my point. It's, it, it's, it's true, but it's not my main point. It shouldn't merely be dogma. We need it to reflect on how we live life with God. How do we, how do we as we say, do life with God? Because if we, if we walk according to his ways, then we find his pleasure. And, you know, so often uh, people say, well, I don't feel close to God. And I think that's a real thing, and I don't want to be harsh about it. But, you know, some of the greatest preachers in ancient times, or maybe not even ancient times, maybe in almost modern times, you know, they, they often pointed out that if people are far from God, God didn't move. Right. God's always there, always waiting. And yet oftentimes, oftentimes we have moved. And it may well be because we've drifted not knowing the word of God and the, the instructions of the Lord. Other times we've drifted because our hearts have become hard. And we're kind of like, eh, that doesn't matter. I'm going to do it anyway. 
And so, you know, in the book of uh, in the book of Isaiah, going on with Isaiah chapter fifty nine, he says, "Behold." Now, "behold"s an interesting word. Just speaking of uh, line upon line, "behold" is an interesting word. It means to look, pay attention, look, watch this carefully. He says, "The Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save." It, look, guys, if you got a problem, it's not that God can't pull you out of the problem nor is his ear dull that he cannot hear. Meaning when you pray, it's not that he has no ability to hear you, but rather your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. Whose problem is it? It's your problem, not God's problem. That's where the separation has come from. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear you. The separation was created by something that you became involved in. Right. Now, I've, I've got more teaching on this. Uh, and again, I don't want to run ahead and try to say everything at once. It is also true, I'll just say this, that if we have been sinned against, the sullying of that sin against us can create a block. Sure. That requires a different kind of ministry. But the fact remains that the problem we have is a sin problem. Whether we sinned or someone sinned against us, our problem is a sin problem. And so when people are obsessing and fretting and they're talking about you know i need to be close to god you know this term intimacy with god gets thrown a lot around a lot these days and people say well we need to be intimate with god and, and i think one could be forgiven for thinking that that means we worship more intensely we sing harder we you know we cry we fall on our knees or our we lay out flat on the ground and we really get into it and that's intimacy with god and, and i'm not opposed to any of that i think there's plenty of scriptural reason to think that that's the normal christian life <clears throat> but in general the idea of intimacy with god in scripture is more tied to do we obey him or do we allow sin to come in and separate us from him and when there's separation well by definition there's no intimacy because you know as we commonly use the term intimacy in modern society intimacy requires us to be you know about six inches apart or less right i mean that's what intimacy is so if we're going to be that close to god then we've got to be sure that we don't have this kind of stuff in our lives where we have compromised where we've denied what the scripture says where we've lived in a way contrary to that which god has laid out because when we do that, it actually pushes us away from him. We feel that separation. And that, that kind of breeds a certain sort of, what do we want to call it, spiritual neurosis? Well, yeah. And I think it's important here, too, because I know there's a lot of people trying to, to theologically do some gymnastics here with, wait a minute, what about Jesus? What about grace? Blah, blah, blah. But yeah. what we're talking about is in a relational paradigm. And so think husband, wife, one of the two are having an affair one of the two are, are openly outside of the covenant. They're moving away from that. Well, there's going to be a break in intimacy. There's going to be that, that break. It's not that Jesus's blood isn't sufficient. That's not what we're talking about. But you've brought in something to this covenant relationship that is anti this relationship. Right. So it's, it's, it's the natural thing that's pushing you away. It's not God turning his face on you or however it's been described that's not where we're going here we're talking about a relational break and that's that's because what you're doing is outside the bounds of what is acceptable within this relationship and it's it's anti this relationship so that's the thing that's driving you away whether it's driving you away whether you're going away or whatever but that's the concept i think it's important to to understand that we're talking about not that god's jesus's grace is insufficient for whatever that's not where we're going and so we're and we're also not talking necessarily heaven hell we're not talking necessarily salvation we're talking about cultivating friendship and intimacy with the father which is the whole goal of everything this is that's why right. we were created to be in relational intimacy with him and so you know this is where we're driving at this and so i just we need to kind of again line up online make sure that we're understanding the conceptually what it is you're talking about because i know people are getting hung up uh, at different things no i think it's a really good clarifying remark i mean honestly this is this is one of my big concerns with the modern hyper grace emphasis that we've seen come into the church i believe in grace of course it's in the scripture sure but the way it has been articulated i mean i've literally heard preachers say if you're in christ you cannot sin 
Well, then why does it say written to Christians in 1 John 1, 9, if we say we have no sin, we lie and the truth is not in us? I mean, it, it directly contradicts the scripture. And if we confess our sins, then the blood of his son, Jesus, cleanses us from all unrighteousness. So it, it remains true that for all of us, you and me included, that at times we, we need to come clean and get the dirty laundry taken care of. We have, to, we have to walk with God as he wants to be walked with. And so what does it say? If we walk in the light as he is in the light, not just walk in the light saying we're in the light, but it's, it's literally doing it. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship with him and the blood of his son cleanses us. So there, this idea of walking is really essential. And, and by the way, the, the old and the new, you know, kind of play off of each other, the old and new testaments. We have a similar idea in Moses with his great encounter with God on the mountain, because Moses in Exodus 33, he says to the Lord, you say to me, bring up this people, uh, and yet you've not let me know who you will send with me. And you have also said, I know you by name, and you have found favor in my sight. And then Moses says, now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, show me your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. It's a really interesting statement, and it could be confusing, but I think what Moses is really saying is, Okay, God, you said I have favor. So for a Christian, what's the analog to that? I'm born again. I'm under the blood. I'm now a son or daughter of God. Okay, so far, so good. But then Moses says this, I want you to show me your ways, God. Teach me how you think. Teach me the stuff that you would really, you'd like me to live in with the objective that I don't violate our covenant or our relationship. And, you know, Grant, you're married, I'm married. Uh, so both of us have some awareness of the things that our wives do not like. It might be something like don't leave your dirty socks on the floor by the bed. It might be clean up the dishes in the sink and put them in the dishwasher. It might be, uh, you know, don't, don't leave your toothbrush on the counter, put it away. It might be hang the toilet paper this way versus that way, whatever it is. But all of these things collectively are the ways of our wives. Yeah. And if we, if we, kind of ignore those things and, and blow them off. I mean, we stay married. Yeah, maybe. Well, presumably. Um, but at the same time, there's a cooling effect that comes over our marriage. And there's a, there's a lack of the joy, the lack of spontaneity. Uh, there's a closedness. And, and, you know, we might even say to one another, hey, what's going on? You, you don't seem present or, you know, you're kind of checked out. What, what, what is that? Oh, nothing. Well, it's something. I mean, wh why why are we not having you know happy communion with one another? Yeah. And by the way, let's just be clear. Sometimes marriages are in this for years, and they're still having sexual relations. So this isn't even principally about sex. It's about it's about that sense of connectivity and so forth. Well, okay. So so we know, or maybe we've ignored the fact that we are doing things that are somehow causing us to be separated from our spouses. And by the way, just to be clear, our wives can do this to us as well. It's not just that men are guilty of this. And so eventually that marriage begins to cool. And this is why, you know, newlyweds are behaving in one way, uh, maybe, maybe even two or three years into the marriage. Whereas a lot of times people that have been married for 15 or 20 years, there's a very different way they are around each other. They, they may not touch one another. And I don't mean sexually, I mean, just touching each other affectionately in public and and so forth looking at each other in that way you tend not to see that as much with people who have been married for a while and a lot of it has to do with violating the ways so what's moses saying i found favor in your sight and now that i've found favor in your sight show me your ways that i may know you in order to find favor in your sight or maybe to say it a little more clearly that i may find more favor in your sight that i may have more intimacy with you I'm intimate, yes, but I want to get deeper with you. And so when we talk about intimacy with God, again, I'm all for the highly enthusiastic worship, but a lot of it has to do with following the precepts of God, doing what God would have us to do, refraining from what God would have us not to do, and not making excuses that that doesn't matter, or that's Old Testament, or he doesn't care that much, or it's all under the blood, or it's all in grace, brother. Because... Oh, that we, we actually break relationship with God 
through our own disobedience. And to, and to push the marriage metaphor just a little bit further, uh, you know, early in our relationship, mine and Sarah's, um, we, we, we found ourselves at that place. Now, here I was, I was trying to fix it. And my way to fix it was buying her gifts, you know, bringing home flowers, all that sort of stuff. But she wanted me to take the trash out when she said to take the trash out. And so I was neglecting the things that she's wanted me to do and doing the things that I thought I shouldn't do that she would want to do. And it didn't work. And this is why the Lord says, your worship in my ears right now, it, it, it's, it's offensive to me. Just stop it. Because he was wanting them to do what he said to do. And, and when we're talking in the course of, of Reformation here, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about, look, yeah, you're doing some stuff. You might be going to a church. You might be given 10%, doubt it, but you might be doing that. Uh, but, you know, you're not doing the things that he's saying to do. You're worshiping in your car to the latest worship track, and it's causing you to have an emotional experience, and you're crying. Great. But you're going then and sleeping with someone that's not your spouse. Stop that. I'd rather you stop sleeping with someone that's not your spouse than singing in your car and crying. And I think that's where we are as a, as a society and culture in the church, is we're doing activities but we're, we're neglecting the things that he said to do, but we're doing the activities that we think maybe we should do or that he won't, you know, whatever. And I think that's where you're driving this. And that's where this whole reformation thing is, is driving at. Right, Kim? That's exactly right. So let's go back to another passage out of Isaiah. Like I said, he's the most quoted of all the prophets. Yeah. Um, Isaiah 29, 13 says this, and the Lord said, now this is the Lord. So, you know, it might be hard to hear, but, but it's, we can't just blow it off where right. we could, but, we better not. Isaiah 29, 13, the Lord said, because his people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, while their hearts are far from me and their fear of me is a commandment taught by men, therefore behold, I will again do wondrous things among them and their discernment will be hidden and their discerning men will be hidden. I, I jumped ahead to the bottom of the verse, but Jesus quotes this, Jesus you know, that Jesus, the guy who's the, you know, son of God and the one who brings grace and mercy to us from the father, Jesus quoted in his own day, what Isaiah had said 700 years before, that this people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. I fear that in our time, much of the church is functioning this way. I look at the, I mean, the sex is an easy one to call out, and, and I think it needs to be called out. But I look at drunkenness. Many Christians today have become, I think, very lax with the way they use alcohol. Uh, that's not to say they can't ever have a glass of wine with dinner or drink beer with a pizza or something. But, but I, I know more than a few Christians that I observe them, and I think there's a lot of alcohol drinking going on here. And one of the strictures that God says is, be not drunk with wine, but rather be filled with the Spirit. So when we're starting to cross into the boundary of, you know, uh, fuzzy toes or a little bit of dizziness and tipsiness. When that's going on, we've gone too far. We've, we've not honored God with our bodies through this stricture against drunkenness. It's not one of the Ten Commandments, but it remains true. And it's, it's clearly in the New Testament that we ought not to be drunk with wine. Here's another one that we might see. You know, the scripture says, let your conversation be seasoned with salt, mm -hmm. always filled with grace. And yet when I look at some of the rhetoric that gets posted on social media, some of the call outs that are going on from Christian leaders and preachers, yeah. uh, this, the, the Bible says that the Lord's servant must not strive. And you know, sometimes the better thing to do is just bide your, bide your peace, bite your tongue, say nothing, don't go there. Right. Sometimes that's a, that's a far better answer in the context of the, you know, of the immediate environment, even though everything inside of you wants to rise up and say, oh yeah, well check this out. But you know, if, if we don't, if we don't, you know, honor the, the behavior of Jesus, which, by the way, we are explicitly admonished to mirror in the book of First Peter. It says when he was being crucified and he was being mocked and spit upon, he answered not a word. You know, there is a time for us to say nothing. And yet I look at the kind of mean-spiritedness, the sort of, um, I, I, well, I don't know, calling people out and the, the social media posts, the stuff that gets said on YouTube or Facebook Lives or whatever, it's not universally that way, but we really need to be monitoring ourselves and saying, so how am I doing with that one? Because if we start to, to verge into that kind of behavior, it's going to quench the Holy Spirit. Sure. And we're going to find ourselves far from God. 
and some would say, well, that's not as big a deal as adultery. Well, it may not be as big a deal as adultery, but it'll still drive the dove away. Well, and, and here's one that's like a positive one. We have, we have an absolute mandate to go and make disciples. How many disciples are you currently making? Or are you not? I mean, there's another one, or you're just flat in disobedience. And so, you know, that one, you're not doing a sin or whatever, but you're break, you're not doing what he said to do. Yeah, you're failing to follow through. Right. And so, so it's just, there's a million ways that we fall short, for sure. But our goal should be to not. Right. Instead of to be comfortable with that's the right. Case, and then we're just going to do whatever we want to do. Well, I think we probably said enough here. Um, it probably overwhelmed some people, but <laughs> this principle of reformation, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, that emphasis, and line upon line, line upon line. This is this is going to be one of the principles of the new reformation. And it really it involves a recovery of scripture, shall we say, authentically taught and lived. This, this is an interesting way of saying it, actually, because one of the things they said about Jesus was, even though he taught from the Bible, the Old Testament, they didn't have the New Testament yet, even though he taught from it, they were like, what is this new teaching with authority? I mean, it, it has life when we hear it. Yeah. That's where we want to get to in our time and it will cause people to see the relevance. It'll answer the Witham principle. What's in it for me? Witham. Uh, it answers the Witham principle. And with that, people will be able to glom onto it. And, uh, and, and they'll carry that in their hearts. Whether or not they, you know, they, they go back and look at that passage again, but it'll, carry, it'll carry in a way where it starts to govern the behaviors that they engage in. So let me, let me ask you this for those of those people listening right now, you know, I think we've, we've spoken a lot in, in kind of like a leadership context, maybe, and um, preaching that's required. And so a lot of people maybe that, that don't preach, um, what, what is the, the typical Christian who's not in some sort of like professional ministry job? Uh, what did they do right now uh, to, in order to begin this, this process where, where they hit stop on this? Uh, and they're hopefully feeling that this is important. What's the next step for them? Well, for every Christian, they need to start reading the Bible more. Um, I, I might I might go so far as to tell them specifically. I, I mean, sometimes on airplanes, I'll read off my Bible apps, but get yourself a real Bible. Uh, it doesn't have to have leather covers. This one does, but that's because leather is, a, you know, it's durable. And this Bible gets a lot of use and a lot of travel. But, uh, you know, get a physical Bible that you can write in, note the insights that you have as you read, uh, get a journal, start to capture some of the thoughts that you have while you're reading the scripture. But you need to, you, to, to pull this off, for most people, you need a Bible reading plan that will, that will keep you on track. And every day you're reading the scriptures. Um, for a lot of you, it's going to mean reallocating your time. Get off of all of your social media for a few minutes and don't look at it so that you can read the Bible. Now, someone's going to say, how long do I need to read it? Look, I don't want to be a, I don't want to be a legalist here, but as a rule of thumb, I would say at least five minutes a day and 15 or 20 would be better. So, you know, you can find that time in your day by getting rid of some other things that might displace Bible reading, but because you are reading the scripture, you're getting it into you. Now, you're going to have to understand it, so you need the precepts, not just the lines, um, and so, you know, get some people who are worthwhile commentators. There's a little discernment needed in that, and, you know, I, I could unpack that a lot, but you, you, you don't just want to necessarily follow somebody because they have 200,000 followers on social media. Some of those people aren't worthy of listening to. Others are better. So you're going to maybe need some guidance and some discernment. But, uh, but you want to understand what you're reading. You might buy a one-volume Bible commentary to help you understand what this is really saying. One single volume. No, it won't be as in-depth as a multi-volume set. But it's something that's manageable for you. Wycliffe Bible commentary is a good one. Uh, the new Tyndall Bible commentary is another one. InterVarsity has one. So IVP, any of those could be a good one volume commentary that will help you understand what you're reading. 
Um, and uh, the other thing I, I might suggest is get a copy of what's called the one year Bible, the one year Bible. And the thing that makes the one year Bible noteworthy, sorry, you want the chronological Bible, the one year version. Um, the, what makes that noteworthy is all of the books of the Bible uh, you know, were written somewhere with a context, but the way they appear in the book could be, depending on which book we're talking about, could be chronologically out of order. Well, that's confusing because you're reading something that happened later before you read something that happened sooner and you don't know who preceded whom. And so you're like, wow, my head's exploding. And so people get confused and bored and lost. If you get the chronological Bible, the one year version, it'll take you through the whole Bible in one year and it'll take you 10 to 15 minutes a day of reading is all it's gonna be. And it'll put it in chronological order. And suddenly a lot of what's confusing will become clear. That's something that anybody could do and everybody should do. I might even say a lot of preachers could probably stand to do that. Yeah. And if you'll do that for three to five years, you'll start to become familiar with the scriptures in a way that you weren't. And that will help you lead a life where your where your living is God-centric and your values and ethics are God-centric, it'll keep you off the rocks. Yeah, that's great. Well, I think that's enough homework uh, for us uh, today and uh, a lot to think about and you know, invite the Holy Spirit into this conversation with you and invite him to, to help lead and guide you into all truth, which is what he's supposed to do. But we want to, uh, we want to say thank you, Ken, uh, for, for leading this charge, um, I think, we won't even understand the importance of all of this uh, until a little bit further down the line. So uh, I know that we're all grateful. I'm hearing a lot of uh, amazing things from people that are listening. So thank you guys for listening. Uh, more information on this can be found uh, at orbisministries.org. .org. And, uh, and you can go there and find all the information that, uh, that you need. And you can come right back here next week as we'll come with our next podcast. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next week.